Well, just one more point on Dahlia, and then I want to just get back to some comments surrounding Biden. Um, you know, he, in the same opinion piece, I mean, he kind of stated the obvious saying that markets prefer capitalists. So at this time, investors from all over the world are asking themselves, one, where can they be most confident that these cash flows will be best? And two, where are these capital values most strongly held and protected? I want to get Jim Rickard's take on that, even though, again, I think it's stating the obvious that the market, markets obviously prefer uh, capitalists. Um, but where do you think uh, most value will be held now? Well, um, I think I think Dalio is a little bit, maybe more than a little bit behind the zeitgeist. So when you set up, and one of the greatest uh, dangers in any uh, analytical method or just conversation, whatever, is what I call the the false dichotomy. You set up like A versus B, black versus white, you know, up versus down frame. And then you're actually missing all the things that don't fit into those categories. So when Ray Dalio says he prefers capitalism, that's and that investors around the world are asking themselves who's, you know, kind of favorable to capitalism, he's setting up a dichotomy between capitalism and something else, probably socialism, communism, et cetera. But I would say that's you having a two factor frame is a completely inadequate for the moment we're in. So what what's happening? And it's, I'm going to talk about this at the rule uh, conference. There's a much bigger show, a much bigger development going on. And it goes by the name of the neoliberal consensus. But the neoliberal consensus is not, um, you know, it's not Ronald Reagan. It's not post World War Two. This goes back to to the beginning of uh, you know, uh, Ludwig von Mises and uh, and Friedrich Hayek are kind of the the avatars, the the biggest brains in that movement. But there are many, many others. But what does that neoliberal consensus? Uh, how does it play out? These are the globalists, and it's not left versus right; it's globalist versus nationalist. That's a much better way to understand what's going on in the world, yeah. and if you're an investor, to understand where you should place your bets. So, what's the um, what was the nirvana of the globalists? It was the period from 1870 to 1914. We really did have a gold standard. It wasn't a Bretton Woods gold standard. It was just countries said, hey, my currency is worth a certain amount in gold. And if you, I'll buy the gold at that price. Or if you want, if, if you want to buy my gold, that's fine. But commerce worldwide was based on a, a lot of countries, certainly starting with the British Empire, but including the United States, we, although the U.S. came along later. But, you know, Peru, uh, Spain, uh, India, which was a colony at the time. But all around the world, countries pegged their currencies to gold. And through a simple transit of law, they were pegged to each other. So fixed exchange rates. But we had um, you know, some version of uh, free trade, free capital flows, um, and uh, and uh, and uh, and free you know free exchange of currencies. So that was the globalist nirvana. It all blew up in World War One. As soon as World War One came along, uh, so the other thing the other thing they wanted was free movement of labor, which means open borders. So the globalists, and I would put Hayek and Mises in this category, um, don't really care about democracy. They don't particularly care about human rights. What they do care about is free capital. Um, uh, free, free trade and free movement of labor to, and they're obsessed with price discovery because they view that world has the best price discovery. Price discovery is a form of information and you can allocate capital rationally and make investment decisions. I get all that, but the problem is you ignore things like um, uh, human organ transplants, the human organ harvesting mm -hmm. without anesthetic of political prisoners in China. That's somehow doesn't fit in. They globalists are willing to overlook that because they have these other ideals. So beginning after World War One, with the League of Nations and everyone, Americans don't really learn the League of Nations because the U.S. didn't join. OK, but we, we were kind of like ancillary members. But the League of Nations really pushed this to a great extent. It blew up again during the Great Depression and World War Two. So now coming out of World War Two, what did we have? We had Bretton Woods. So we're kind of back to. Uh, a gold standard back to, you know, kind of open capital flows, which took a while to develop. Um, and uh, and above all, free trade in the general agreement, tariffs and trade, which turned into the World Trade Organization. And China was admitted in the year 2000. So this was the globalist agenda. They didn't care that China was communist. They didn't care about things like that. 
Now there's now a massive reaction to that. What's going on with Marine Le Pen in France? The European right. Parliament elections. The, the here comes Nigel Farage with his own party in the UK. They're going to throw out Rishi Sunak. They're going to throw out Macron. They're going to throw out Biden. Uh, Putin is in a very solid position. What do uh, Orban and uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary? What do they all have in common? They're nationalists. They're not globalists. So there are still going to be winners and losers. But if Dalio is thinking of capitalist versus socialist, I would say wrong frame, wrong century. You have to think today of uh, nationalist versus globalist. Or not, 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 don't think of um, uh, capitalist versus socialist. Think of nationalist versus globalist. That's the right way to think about where the opportunities lie. And the nationalists are winning. Do you think the Re Republican Party is aware of that? The Republican Party is the Nationalist Party. The the globalists in the Republican Party, the rhinos, are being run off the road one by one. It takes time. Mitch McConnell stepping aside at the end of this year. Nikki Haley is toast. Um, the Bushes are, you know, played an important role, but they're yesterday's news. Uh, one by one, the uh, globalists are being run out of, of the Republican Party and they're being replaced by nationalists. Um, so uh, that's that's very far along. It's going to be uh, it's going to be ingrained after the election. Trump will win. Uh, and I uh, uh, look, I, you know, I voted for Trump in 2016. I'll, I voted for him in uh, 2020. I, I actually voted for him this year in the New Hampshire primary. So I have a pretty good track record of voting for Trump. But I am a fierce critic of Trump because of the way he bungled the transition in 2016. That was like a once in a century opportunity. See, Trump never drained the swamp because he couldn't find the swamp. He didn't understand what the swamp was. The swamp is the deep state, but there's actually a book. It's called The Plum Book. It's a list of every federal job where the president has power of appointment. You know, some require Senate confirmation, but many do not. Trump, Trump said, well, I'm not gonna worry about appointments because if I don't like you, you're fired. That may work in New York real estate. It does not work in Washington, D.C. He hired a bunch of, you know, people, uh, I think of uh, Christopher Wray, head of the FBI, as a neo-fascist. I think I'm right about that. Donald Trump appointed Christopher Wray. So if you're, if you're Donald Trump, don't whine to me about, you know, the FBI is all over you. Well, you appointed the director. You picked Christopher Wray. So why don't you get some better advice? Why don't you get some better appointees? That's the bad news. The good news is they are. The, I think Trump has learned his lesson um, you know, 78 year old guy doesn't change his spots very easily, but I think he learned that that was a wasted opportunity. He knows this will be his last term. Um, they've got two things going on heritage foundation, um, project, uh, uh, 2025, uh, it's, it's called mandate for leadership 2025. Uh, Peter Navarro is coming out with a book where he kind of lays out this there's the plum book itself there are resources out there but if you want to see what trump's going to do in a second term you know check those resources and you can see this is going to be a radical change and it's going to, so to sh short answer your question uh daniela is that the republican party is the nationalist party and the globalists are being run out of the room interesting jim